All right, guys, this is the comic book haul for the month of September 2016. <laughs> Sorry, guys, as soon as I started this video, uh, I got a lamp over here that's going off and on and buzz, and I guess the bulb's going to explode, and my phone just went off. But anyway, so far, today is the 19th of September in the year 2000. <laughs> the light <laughs> flashes on. And then the phone goes off again. This is hilarious. But anyway, today is September 19th. I'm about to uh, take a few days where work is going to be sending me to the other side of Virginia. I'm probably going to be gone, I don't know, two or three days. And uh, last week I took some personal time off and uh, took care of a few things and went and saw a real close friend of mine. She gave me some comics. Mmm, awesome. Say here. Awesome. Sorry, guys. Anyway. <laughs> that was so rude. Anyway, so I went to a couple places over the, since the last month's haul and stuff and uh, picked up quite a few things. It's real sporadic here. And I'll try to just go on, get going with it here, so I uh, don't turn into like a real long video, you know, didn't know how to chat. But anyway, uh, looks like we'll go backwards here a little bit, okay? Got this through eBay, and it's not that big of a deal, really. It's not one of those impossible books to find, but for me, this is the end of a 30-year journey, for real, to find an affordable copy that's in good shape. I really messed up about, I don't know, four or five years ago at a flea market, because they had five dollars, uh, they had five copies that I could have got a dollar a piece on them. But between the sun beating down on me and it being the end of the day and being hungry and hadn't ate, you know, just being out there and stuff like that, it didn't register until two, three days later. I mean, you talk about a dumbass move, you know, and stuff like that. But anyway, I got this for two dollars and fifty cents. This is Green Lantern one ninety five. Uh, it's basically where Guy Gardner, uh, during the Crisis on Infinite Earths, becomes a you know, Green Lantern proper. Okay, big deal for me. One of those books, uh, you know, in my golden age of collecting, I guess, and you know, stuff like that. Uh, to finally run across a very nice copy for a very nice price, uh, which was good. Like I said, this this isn't one of those books that's you know highly expensive or anything, but it's just. Yeah, around here, you just don't run across many in the wild that's worth picking up. Very happy about that, okay? Uh, today, I stopped by a place called Ollie's. It's sort of like uh, a Big Lots, if you have those around there. Um, i trying to think what, what they... It's kind of like, um, you know, if a bunch of merchandise stops off the, you know, drops off the back of a truck and gets a little bit damaged, or if a store goes out of business or they're moving merchandise that didn't sell, they get it and they sell it at a discount. And they get comics and stuff. And I ended up picking this up on a whim. Uh, it's called Deathmatch by Paul Jenkins and Carlos Magno. Uh, it was $1.99. And Paul Jenkins uh, wrote The Inhumans and Marvel Knights during the 90s. Uh, he wrote Origin, the Wolverine Origin, where we find out he's James Hallett. Uh, Batman, Spider-Man, other things, you know. Um, I discovered him on a Hellblazer run uh, back in the day. I read a few issues of the Hellblazer he did. He had a, he had a pretty good run on it there. Uh, but anyway, uh, but what was interesting about this is I read in the back, on the back of it, it's kind of like a twisted take on Secret Wars maybe, but some supervillain that's highly powerful has taken all the heroes and trapped them on this planet and they have to do death matches where they, like it says, they fight to the death till there's, I guess there's going to be one winner or something like that. And I went through it and, um, that <laughs> lamp, man. I went through it and, uh, what caught my eye actually was the art. It's very interesting art. When you first look at the art, your mind immediately, or at least for me, went to this guy who, this Carlos guy, he's drawing like Ian Churchill. He's drawing like Ethan Van Skyver, a little bit of Pat Broderick in there. I started looking through it and uh, it's really interesting, man. I'm seeing influences of Mobius. I'm seeing influences of uh, co-creator Judge Dredd, Carlos in Negro. I can't think of his name, but check out the, the you know, the guy who helped co-create, um, you know, Judge Dredd. I see some of that in there. 
And there are pages where I see a lot of Ian Churchill, but it's really odd because it's almost like, it gives me the feeling like this guy, you know, Carlos Magno and Ian Churchill may have had the same influences, if that makes any sense. Um, very interesting. So um, this is volume one. Supposedly there's a volume two. This is, like I said, from Boom Studios uh, 2013, uh, the trade of it. Very interesting. I want to end up reading this tonight. Okay. Um, where are we at here? Okay, so, like I said, I went and saw a friend who I've uh, become very close to. And she has some comics and stuff like that she gave me. Then she put some things on loan to try to get me back into a series. I, I was there at the foreground of Saga. Uh, these are just loaners. But, uh, you know, no big deal. Just volume one and two of us of Saga. I know a lot of people are into Saga in the community. And I remember when this book came out and it was all over the place and uh, spiked up real high. Number one issue spiked really quick. And when this thing came out, when Saga came out, it was being compared to Star Wars. When I read it, it was being compared to the golden years of uh, Heavy Metal Magazine, 77 to 83. A lot of stuff in there. So she loaned me uh, Saga 1 and 2, Volume 1 and 2. And the reason I quit, there's only been two series I quit because I was actually disgusted where the story went. Um, you know, usually I've got this attitude of like, be careful how you critique uh, because... You know, is it constructive criticism uh, or is it merely the fact that it's not the way you would have done it? Okay, but uh, with Saga, when they, spoiler warning there, uh, they killed the Stalk, a character called the Stalk in there. She was like a Venus de Milo merged with a gigantic spider. Uh, she was grotesque, yet I found her attractive. Yes, you can judge me, you know. Really odd with her. Um, killed her, I was a little like, you know. And I always thought I was kind of contrary about things uh, in life uh, until I started really thinking about it thanks to Saga. Seems like I always go kind of the opposite way a little bit on some things. People would like something, I didn't, and it was a flash in the pan. I'd find something six months before and wonder why six months later people would really like it. This was music and television, everything like that. And I. But that's not true. That's kind of like a choice. You kind of observe people what's going on. When I was reading the first, I don't know, 80 issues of Saga, I fell in love with the stalk as a character. I thought, oh, that's a cool character. A lot can be done with that. And other people, and they still go, are, go with Lion Cat. You know, that seems to be the breakout kind of cult character. Neither here nor there. This camera's messing up because of the lamp. Well, but we're going to go. I'm a one-take guy kind of guy. All right, some books she gave me. Out of her collection, uh, she's kind of refining her collection. Uh, she knows I like uh, Cerebus, so I got issue uh, 79 of Cerebus from her, or the issue where he's stuck in a wall. Uh, getting really good chunk of the 300 issue series of, that I'm getting. She gave me uh, some mod more modern books, Southern Cross uh, number one here to check out. No idea about these books, so we can get through them. Uh, gave me a uh, nice little uh, sketch cover variant of um, Vampirella number one by Nancy A. Nancy a. Collins. Uh, no idea about this series either, but I love my Vamp Vampirella. And I also got issue number two. So, big fan of uh, Vampirella, especially in the magazines. Gave me a uh, image first reprint of Birthright number one. Threw me a little fantasy in there. I think she had a, a trade in her car and while we were riding around. I was flipping through it. Uh, she gave me this, um, very much into Sandman, uh, the Neil Gaiman stuff, the Vertigo of the 90s stuff that was out there. And this is a three-issue prestige format um, miniseries of Destiny, uh, Chronicle of Death Foretold. With Kent, you know, The art is by Kent Williams and, and Mike Zuli. And Kent Williams is hurting me in this with his art. Uh, the man's truly an artist, but I, some of his stuff, I was just looking at this. I don't like art that I look at and it looks like I could have done on my notebook. I mean, that's a harsh, but I can't help it. But Mike Zuli, uh, his parts of it seem to bring it home. I flipped through the first page for a little bit here, but here's one. Uh, issue two, fantastic covers by Kent Williams, you know. And issue three. And I got a feeling that he's the kind of artist, he gets a lot of criticism, but the man is talented. You know, let me put that out there. The man has a vision. Composition's very well done. He does tell the story. 
wow, you know, some of the stuff that's in there, you know. Um, and then I, I thought I needed two more issues of this. Uh, War of the Gods. My collection, collecting is starting to get a little bit more refined. There's certain things. I'm not getting a lot of things due to nostalgia or because I always wanted to read that or because of an opportunity. I'm really getting more refined. I'm getting cl close to having all the crisis books that tied into the Crisis of Infinite Earths. I uh, need two issues to complete my Secret Wars 2 run. I uh, finished up all the Blackest Nights finally. Things like that, right? War of the Gods would probably be next, but when uh, I ended up picking up, excuse me, War of the Gods number three, fantastic George Perez cover there. George Perez, this was their event. This is when DC was starting to have the events every year. Crisis, Millennium, Invasion, War of the Gods, probably something in between there and stuff. And it was time for George Perez to pop up. Now, at the time, George Perez ended up taking up the mantle after Crisis uh, with Lynn Wine and George Perez eventually just took over the whole thing. You know, he was doing Wonder Woman. So it was time to have a Wonder Woman story. And it was the Greek gods versus the Roman gods. And that pulled ended up pulling in Captain Marvel uh, being with the Roman gods, I think. And, you know, uh, Wonder Woman with her history, the Amazon's history of, with the Greek gods, you know, they ended up becoming sort of like their main warriors. And these crossed over in other books. George President of Brightness, he did the layout, Cynthia Martin came in and worked on his layouts and got inked. And each issue has like some great pinups in them by um, Chris Sprouse, inked by George Perez. But it's a real lackluster story. And I'm a George Perez fan, you know, so I was kind of real forgiving about it. Um, but what I ended up finding out years later in the interview is that George Perez admits that this was lackluster because of his workload. He was drawing infinity gauntlet at the same time he was writing this and trying to do the layouts and he's doing covers and he was doing inks and he had just had a big full plate that was going on and i think that kind of played a part in the story getting hurt a little bit and the fact that he didn't last all six issues on infinity gauntlet he just took off more than he could chew and he was writing wonder woman at the time and doing this and you know it's had a huge workload but um uh, you know i finally have all four books there I'm real happy about that now i can give it a chance years later see how it is um, what do we got here? Hillsville Flea Market. Anybody that's watched my videos for years knows at least twice a year you're going to get a video where I come in with a huge haul that I got. A, I did the hustle, the Haller Hustle on and got a lot of great books on the cheap and stuff and got in there and, you know, it's, it went pretty good. And this year, uh, I, I've been saying it for a year and a half, two years, the comic book market, uh, back issue market, the flea markets and yard sales and stuff is shrinking not as many dealers are there. The comics just aren't there. A lot of people, I think, have been trying to get out. Um, but what happened was is that like three of the four dealers I went to, uh, one of the dealers gave me a card. I don't think it's here. I'll throw give them a shout out in another video. Uh, but what happens is three of the four dealers knew who I was because of these videos. I bought off them and they ran across me, however. And two of the guys were just flat out watching me like a hawk, making sure what I pulled out. One guy was real excited to see me. I'd bought a Johnny Quest uh, comic from the 60s off of him a couple years ago, and he remembered me and found me on YouTube and stuff. Real nice guy, talking to me a whole lot, telling people who I was. We talked some comic book trivia. You know, it was fun and stuff like that. But with the other two guys and things like that, I just I just could not relax. Uh, you know, they were just like, you know, the YouTube things backfired. The Haller Hustles backfired. Finding the books in their, you know, the little gems and little treasures in their back issue boxes just finally bit me in the ass. So I ended up just getting a few books and I might have spent five or six bucks. And I could kick myself on this one, right? The guy actually had all four issues of this series, but I just went with issue one. I, I, I was just ready to get out of there, man. But I got a uh, Corm, Michael uh, Moorcock's Corm, The Bull and the Spear. This is 89 from First Comics. This was a four-issue miniseries. That's, that is a uh, Mike Magnolia cover. Great stuff. I also finished up the Prestige format that came out, uh, and it took a long time for all four issues to come out. Due to Walt Simonson, uh using some new techniques of art to do this, you know, experimenting with the techniques of art with, uh, I think it was like uh, mechanical pins and different size Bristol board and things like that. But this was a pre four issue prestige format prequel, prequel to uh, the first Elric book. You know, I think it's what it is, or it's the making of a sorcerer. So uh, Lords of Chaos and all sorts of things. So I have all four issues. I can now read them. 
Uh, one of those books that whenever I see it, it needs a home. This was a hot book at one time during the 80s, Alpha Flight number 13, because it had Wolverine returning to Canada and the Alpha Flight for an issue there. And it is that he is there due to a funeral, if I remember. Uh, and like I said, I am now two issues uh, to getting Secret Wars 2. The Amazing Spider-Man issues for Secret Wars 2 have been a little pricey that I found, so I cannot believe I found this great issue. And what's interesting about this cover, it's done by Larry Lieber and uh, John Romita Sr., I think. Yeah, Larry Lieber is Stanley's brother. So, you know, we have an old school cover there by an old, in ink by the, an old school uh, artist there for Spider-Man. I grabbed this uh, Croft uh, Super Show issue from a Gold Key, or what is that? Oh my gosh, Whitman from Whitman Comics back in the 70s. I love these little, used to get those in three packs and stuff. And check it out, man. We got an old school ad that's of the sea monkeys where everybody thought they got the sea monkeys. They have a little family and it ended up being Brian Shrimp. Uh, a lot of people don't know, but I believe this was uh, uh, drawn by Joe Orlando of EC Comics fame and editor fame and comic books fame. And a book I got, not, I got a real good deal on that I never really thought I would get. I'm also collecting like the half issues of Wizard. I'm never going to have them all because a lot of them are just promotional pieces. Uh, I mean, of course, I ran across a good deal on them. I'd get them and stuff. But getting EXO uh, half issue, this particular dealer that I got this off of was telling me that the Valiant comics have really gone up. So to get an EXO Man of War back in the day of, uh, of uh, Valiant comics really kind of taken off there, uh, the half issue, that was kind of cool to find. Okay, cool. Uh, then we had a flea market, uh, another flea market around here. Um, in a place called Dublin, Virginia. Uh, I think a Lions Club throws it every year and stuff. They great little flea markets, one of the cleanest ones. It's got a couple records. Uh, real glad to get these. Walk on the Wild Side, the best of Lou Reed. I've been listening to this. I'm actually thinking about doing a video where it's just kind of a discussion of vinyl versus digital. Is there a difference? You know, it's not going to be one of those fact based. Um, that lamp is killing me. One of those fact based history of a lot of things. You know, it's just going to be a discussion as a. As a you know, lover of music and stuff. But I found this, man. I'm on a mission for God. You know, it's awesome. Blues Brothers, man. And the people that they were able to pick on their band, for their band, uh, th these, these were some very uh, respected and talented guys in the music business and stuff like that. And thanks to them being on Saturday Night Live and being so popular, they were to really pick and choose who they wanted, you know. Dan Aykroyd, yeah, the whole history of Blues Brothers amazes me. Okay, at that same flea market, I ended up picking up these. Some trading cards, right? Whoops, upside down. Cosmic Teams, this was a wax pack. I don't usually buy things like this. I do have a trading card set uh, uh, collection in there and stuff like that, but I've never really bought a wax pack that I can recall. I'm sure I probably bought one or two somewhere, but check out that display. Look at that. These are all empty packs in there. This thing is just fantastic. But what the reason I got it is because on the side here we have a Joe Kubert JSA. Um, we go around here. We got some uh, Chris Sprouse Legion. This is all about the teens. You know, it's supposed to be you know. This is Barry Keeg, Ke uh, Barry Ketson. I think it's who it was. Uh, Legion eighty nine, Legion ninety, Legion ninety one. They change the number every year the book was out. So I went through the wax pack, and I think I'm missing like four or five, uh, um, you know, a bunch of holograms that came out there. But uh, what was really cool about these is when you display the cards in threes, uh, you know, they, they make a, you know, they give you that widescreen feel. You know, different artists on them and stuff. But you got me a Joe Kubert, Justice Society page. And like I said, there's pages and pages of this and stuff. Uh, I put these uh, on my Instagram, and the Instagram sends them to Twitter and Facebook and stuff, uh, some of these pictures. And then I got a good deal on these, man. I got 10 bucks the first time I went around, and I think I gave the guy, I cannot remember, one of my friends was there uh, at the Dublin Flea Market. But I think these books might have came to like 13 bucks or something, I think. Um, so, you know, they might come to $2 a piece or something. And the best thing that I got from this guy was I got an upgrade. Came, he was charging $6 for this, but I got it for maybe two. Uh, Howard the Duck, number one. Definitely an upgrade. Beautiful copy, strangely enough. Very nice. 
Okay, I got this wizard magazine. I mean, I got a whole collection of wizards down here on the bottom shelf. I was a wizard guy. Uh, they always came out with multiple cuts, two, at least two, two, three covers are there for a while for all their issues. But I got this beat up copy solely for the Alex Ross Astro City uh, thing. I'm going to end up ripping this off and probably framing it. I mean, that'd be kind of cool. But yeah, it, oh, good stuff. You know, if this video wasn't running long, I'd show more of it. Moving on with what else we have here. I uh, got this hardback. And it's from IDW, and it's a Harlan Ellison story uh, called Phoenix Without Ashes. Uh, can't wait to read this. Uh, I would love to sit there and read the synopsis of it, but it would take forever. You know. May do a video on it. Um, completely my John Byrne Wonder Woman uh, run. And you can say what you will about John Byrne's later years and stuff like that, but this Wonder Woman run that he did uh, I want to say he might have lasted close just a hair short of three years or something on it this is Wonder Woman 135 you got all sorts of you got like five different versions of Donna Troy on here word balloons on the cover but in the 20s when he ended up killing uh, Wonder Woman Diana and she became the goddess of truth those books dried up you could not find them to buy them around here okay and then by the time we got into 130s and everybody figured out that Diana wasn't really going to be dead or whatever was going on, you could all of a sudden find them again. But they dried up big time. Uh, I wish I still had the uh, run of X-Men that I, I had like 100, uh, what was it? I had a solid 80 issue run of X-Men I collected right off the rack back in the day. And there was about, I think, two years in a row they went bi-weekly during the summers and stuff, right? But this was always one of the greatest covers, in my opinion, that Mark Silvestre had done for the X-Men, a crucified uh, Wolverine on an X. And if you knew about the X-Men back in the day, everything they represented and how they were hated and stuff, this, this is a powerful cover. Uh, it did remind me of Conan the Barbarian being crucified uh, by a great pinup or cover or whatever it was by John Bushima, you know. I picked this up because uh, this is my kind of thing. It looks like it has a K-Man theme. Superman, Blood of the Ancestors. I think an alien comes down, messes with Superman's mind, and he ends up getting stories of ancient Krypton in his head. And I don't know. Starts reacting to him and stuff. But uh, Gil Kane, uh, Gil Kane art, John Bushima art. This is around 2002. And Kevin Bowling, uh, uh, Kevin Nolan, excuse me. Great artist on this thing, man. Uh, but Hellblazer Books of Magic, number one of a two issue miniseries. I don't know if this is a double for me, but I've always been looking for the other one. I have one other issue. This could be the double. Who knows? A little Vertigo series that a lot of people don't know about. And oh, there we go. And then these were some solid finds. A Fanta Graphics issue, number 31, of uh, Yusaki Yojimbo. Our, our Samurai Rabbit in Fuel Japan. And issue three of Space Usagi. I think I just need issue number two now. Great stuff. All kinds of fun. And I also ended up picking up these for five bucks. Uh, got on this series from the get-go. Sandman had ended. Sandman was supposed to be a creative consultant on it, which probably means he just sort of like gave it an approval to go on with the story. But it's the first six issues of The Dreaming. Uh, stories that pertain to the cast of the Sandman, Neil Gaiman's Sandman and stuff by different creators. Sort of an anthology series, I guess, or I might not be the right, episodic, very episodic. Uh, uh, it had a rotating creative uh, team that would come on it. They would tell their story in one issue, two issues, three issues, maybe six issues, and they would move on. Uh, but I ended up selling the first six, and I have no idea. That's number one with Goldie, the gargoyle on it, uh, Cain and Abel story. Yeah, number two, uh, Monty Pythonish with that foot, very Terry Gilliam. Yeah, I found Dave McKean's work on these covers to be very, uh, very good. What is that? Number four, Set in the Dream. I think that's the start of a new story. Mad Hattie. You have to read the stories. You know, our, emo our extremely centuries old uh, bag lady in England. And number six. So looking around, I think that's it, guys. I think I got that out in pretty good time. Uh, so, uh, you know, I've got a few videos I plan on making. Uh, might make them on the road on the hotel room uh, while work has me out of town. Um, might make another one tonight. Who knows? Okay. All right. Later, guys.